Welcome to Improving Intimacy, a podcast to help single and married Latter-day Saints strengthen their family connections and marriages. Daniel A. Burgess is the host of Improving Intimacy. Daniel's a marriage and family therapist, father, husband, and author. Here's Daniel on this episode of Improving Intimacy. Welcome to another episode of Improving Intimacy. I'm really excited today. We get to have Leanne back on with us and we get to explore some of the uh, topics that we addressed in the previous podcast in a little bit more depth. And I'm ex- excited and thankful that you, Leanne, are, are willing to come back on and explore these topics uh, further with us. Uh, there was a lot of excitement with people who listened to your podcast and were just craving more. And um, this is a very private and very vulnerable experience for you. So I, I really appreciate you coming on and being willing to uh, explore some of these topics uh, in depth. There's clearly a need um, and it's moved a lot of people to hear your story. So let's turn it over to you. Where do you want to start? What do you feel from the people who've listened to your podcast and the comments that have been made? Where do you feel it's important to start? Um, Well, first off, thank you for having me back. I'm excited to be back on here. And like you say, to go over more in depth of my journey and how I got to where I am today. But basically, I just want to start off with um, my struggles, like what my struggles were with my sexuality and what was holding me back for years and years. Like I struggled for probably, we've been married for 31 years, and I probably struggled for 25 of those years, um, overcoming some hurdles and and issues that I had um, in order to be able to step into my sexuality. So Basically, that's just wanna, what I want to share with everyone today is how I overcame um, what those struggles were and how I worked through them, how I overcame them, how I was able to um, think differently. I think so often when we try to improve our sexuality, like we come from, we come to it from like sex, like we try to, you know, what what sex acts can improve my sexuality? What, what things can I be doing in the bedroom to make me like it more? And I think too often we're just chasing after sex acts when really, especially for women, our biggest sex organ truly is our brain. And one of the things I learned, um, just like heard about, I haven't read any of her books, Emily Nagowski. I've never read any of her books, but I've heard people explain about her brakes and accelerators. And I realized that for years and years, as because I wanted to want sex. I wanted to like sex. Like I did have that desire all through the years of my marriage. I just could not figure out how to get there. And so I would try different things over the years. But what I realized with brakes and accelerators was even though I was trying to push on the gas and, and go forward and, and figure it out, I was standing on the brakes like I had so many issues piled up that I just didn't have my foot on the brake I was standing hard on the brake and so that was preventing me to make any forward movement at all in in the area of of intimacy does that make sense it it does and for those who aren't familiar with Emily's book it's come as you are great book very Mm -hmm. very insightful gets into exactly what you're talking about, the the science and the process our brains go through in experiencing sexual arousal. Tell us a little bit more, though. What do you mean you're standing on the break? What did that look like for you? What were you doing or not doing? Um, for me, it, and, and standing on the breaks, I guess, meant for me, just anytime I would try to make any forward progress in my marriage, like one of the issues that I want, you know, I'll talk about some of these issues that were holding your, holding me back, they would just come forward to the surface and then I would be slamming on that break again. And so, yeah, I guess going forward, talking here, we'll just start talking about some of those things that yeah, let's jump kept right me in. with my foot on the break. Okay. So first off, when I finally decided that I really wanted to start working on my sexuality, one day I came across a, a little meme on Facebook and it broke down the word intimacy. And I'm sure people have seen this before, but it broke it down to me um, saying into me see. And I kind of break it down to like into me you see. And what that means to me is for me, a, the goal in marriage is to have a desire to know your partner on a very deep level 
And then to also allow your partner to know you on that very deep level. And for me, that means like knowing your partner's heart, their mind, their spirit, their body, and then letting them also know your heart, your mind, your spirit, your body. And so I really wanted that. That was the goal of me being able to work on my sexuality was I wanted all of that. I wanted all the intimacy had to offer. And so that was the driving force that moved me forward to really working on my sexuality. But first, the first thing I think that I had to figure out was in order to be intimate on a sexual level and to have true intimacy in a marriage, you really need to work on all the levels of intimacy in your marriage. And that means working on the psychological intimacy in your marriage, which means, you know, honesty, loyalty, trust, and commitment. I feel like that is the foundation to your marriage is those four things, honesty, loyalty, trust, and commitment. And then the other areas um, are verbal, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, physical. And then I've also added like recreational. But in order to really be able to work on that physical level, the other levels had to also be being worked on. It's not just enough to say, I want a wonderful intimate life into an intimate sexual life. I feel like it was important in my marriage to work on all the levels. And once my husband and I started to work on all those levels of intimacy within our marriage, then it was easier to work on the physical intimacy part. I think so often we hear that women are more emotional. And for me, that's definitely true. And so I had to feel like things were being worked on outside of the bedroom in order for me to also be working on things inside of the bedroom. Before we get there, and maybe you're going to address this, but what did you have to do yourself in the previous podcast and online, you've talked a lot about how you have to face your own trauma. You have to face your own, um, holdups around this before you can engage and improve your relationship together. That's a very difficult place for people who especially experience trauma and, um, mental health issues around intimacy. How did you get there. What, what did you do to um, you? We already discovered in the previous podcast that you do have a level of insight that I think is a little higher than most people. But regardless, what did you do to recognize, okay, I need to address this. This is my issue that I need to overcome. And what steps did you take? I honestly think the thing that really hit me the hardest when I started to really face myself was one day I was, it was the very, very first podcast that I listened to from Jennifer Finlayson Fife and I can't even remember where I, it was I know it was some LDS site um, like LDS Living or something and I've tried to find it and I haven't been able to, to find it since but she talks in that podcast about we really need to bring our very best self to our partners every day Like we need to take a good long look at ourselves and ask ourselves, would we want to be married to ourselves? Would would I want to be married to someone like me? And when I really started to look hard at myself and answer that question, the answer was no. Like I would not want to be married to me. I was not nice because of some of the anxieties that I faced. I gave myself permission to act badly towards my husband, either in coming from a place of I'm trying to protect myself or then also coming from a place of excusing my anxieties and saying, I can't help it. This is just how I soothe myself. It's how I soothe my anxieties is to control everything that's around me. And so it really hit me hard when I listened to that podcast when, when she said, we, we need to bring our best self to our spouse every day. And I feel like my husband, for the most part, did bring his best self to me every day. He is so kind and very caring and very patient. And I realized that I wasn't giving the same. Was there a point, and maybe I'm making some assumptions here, that you viewed him as the broken one with with the issues around pornography and maybe his behavior in the bedroom? Did you view him as the broken one and then have this epiphany like, oh my goodness, I'm the one who's struggling here. It definitely played a role. It played a role in, in the bedroom. It played a role just because I had so my foot so hard on the brakes that I, yes, you know, he's just using my body. 
because of what he's seen. Yes, exactly. That. Thank you for clarifying it. That's what I was alluding to. Yes. Yeah, so some of the struggles within like the actual sexual realm of things, I, I could blame some of them on him, but I also knew what was going on in my own head surrounding some of the struggles that I had. And so then I just realized I needed to work on them. (laughs) Yeah. Again. So you had that level of insight where you're able to acknowledge. And I think for the most part, most people are like that, uh, specifically women. I, I think there is that level. Okay. I know there's an issue here with me too, but the pain and the difficulties in the relationship make it difficult to focus on that inward self because you see other problems in the relationship that you want to address or think are bigger and contributing to that. In this case, maybe the pornography, it's tempting to say my husband's behavior is is what's triggering me. And until he fix it, fixes it, I can't fix myself. But you weren't seeing that, or at least at this point you were saying, no, I got to address myself too. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I knew it was part of it, but I knew it was definitely not all of it. So I finally had to just face myself. Like, I need to figure this out. So then some of the things that I I struggled with, like the first one being the good girl syndrome. And I talked about that the other day. I think it's so hard and not in just LDS relationships, but also I've heard lately more just in Christian relationships, you know, in, in religions that really kind of stifle sexuality or have such a, you know, strong um, belief around, you know, waiting till you're married. So we get this message growing up that kind of that it's like a bad thing. Like we don't do this, it's bad. And then all of a sudden when you're married, it's okay, it's fine now. It's really, really hard to change gears for a lot of women and not just women, but for some men too. It's really hard to all of a sudden think it's okay. And so I, I had to get over that good girl syndrome and just really come to embrace the fact that I was created to be a sexual being as well as a emotional and intellectual and spiritual being. I was also created to be a sexual being. And I think so often, you know, growing up and nobody talking to us when we're teenagers of how to embrace that sexuality, we try to repress it. And I think the other thing I struggled with, and I talked about this on the last podcast was, I struggled to be sexual and spiritual within the same body. That didn't that didn't make sense to me of how to marry the two. And so the dangers in that, though, was I was completely shutting down my sexuality because I thought that my spiritual self should learn how to control the physical self. And by doing that, it's like you're cutting off your arm. Like when you shut down, you're cutting, you're shutting down a part of who you are. And let, let, let me pause you right there for a second, because that's, I think, an important statement there. And I want to make sure that the listeners understand what you just said. It, it tell us a little bit more about what it means for at least what your paradigm was at the time that you're thinking the spiritual self should, would you say, control my, my sexual behavior or my sexual desire and you couldn't marry them together? What were you Tell us a little bit more about what that meant to you at the time. I feel like it meant that if I, you know, we hear that like, you know, about our carnal selves and that we need to learn, you know, control our carnal selves and the natural man is an enemy to God. And so I think I was equating that my, my sexual part of myself was carnal. It was dirty. It was naughty. It was wanting things that it shouldn't want. And so. And that's why you were shutting it down is, is Mm -hmm. the experience Mm -hmm. you're having spiritually. So what was that? Did, did, did you feel like it was the spirit telling you that this was inappropriate, that this was dirty, this shouldn't be pursued. And if you did, how do you view that insight now? Do you, do you still look at that and say, yes, that was a spirit telling me that, or, or how do you reconcile that now? No, I don't believe that was a spirit at all. I think that was fear. I think it was fear. I think it was guilt. It was shame. It was those. It was those feelings. Um, They were very negative. And I don't think that's how the spirit worked. (laughs) Yeah. And it's interesting, though, because this is not the first time I've heard this. And I've had many, many people come in and say, this isn't right. The the spirits tell me it isn't. Um, But typically... 
And who am I? I can't tell somebody that they're not feeling the spirit, but this is usually what I'm discovering is it's, it's fear. How would you guide people who are trying to sort that out to distinguish between the spirit and the fear or guilt that they're feeling around it? And why are they confusing the two? Kind of a bunch of questions there, but I guess how would somebody distinguish that? What, what did you do to identify that really wasn't the spirit that was actually fear and guilt? When I finally decided that I was going to work on my sexuality and really open up my perceptions and my thinking around it and, and just become more open in my thinking, very quickly when I started to work on things with my husband, like there was a difference. I, our relationship just grew so quickly. Um, whereas before there was just, it was a hindrance to our relationship. It progress was not being made. Um, the guilt was there that, that I should not feel that way towards my husband. Like it's a beautiful thing. And if there's guilt for even trying to become closer, I mean, that's not right. That's not what Heavenly Father wants for us. He wants us to be close, very, very close in that relationship. And so once I just decided, I'm not going to feel these feelings of guilt anymore. I'm not going to allow them into my mind. And started to work on things with my husband, like very, very quickly things moved along at a really beautiful pace, like really beautiful, wonderful things were happening within my marriage. Are you willing or comfortable with sharing any details, uh, experiences around that? Well, one thing, and I, I kind of have like details interwoven when I talk about some of my struggles, but so there's the one struggle that I had of giving and receiving. Dr. De Jennifer Finlayson Five talks about this a lot, like truly being able to receive from your partner and you truly being able to give to your partner. Um, I think so often as women, we have a hard time receiving because we're always on the giving and the serving end and the doing and the taking care of kids. It's, we have a really hard time receiving sometimes. And so the very first time that I had really learned how to calm my anxieties down in the bedroom and there was one particular time when we were being intimate and I, for the first time ever, I felt on a very deep level of how much my husband was giving to me, like giving his whole self to me, his heart, his spirit, his mind, like his body. And I just had tears just streaming down my face because I felt like his goodness was pouring into me. And I afterwards I was like I felt that like I felt your generosity towards me I felt your love and your goodness and he said I've been trying to love you that way for 27 years but you shut me down I was just such in a place of my mind was just so closed because of the guilt that I couldn't even open up to begin to accept what he was trying to offer me through his sexuality what an amazing experience. He was able to tell you that in, in those words is you were shutting me down. Mm -hmm. Yep. It sounds like you maybe uh, you were ready and in place to, to hear that. I don't know if I recommend every husband say that to their spouse. But <laughs> I definitely, yes, I definitely was in a place to hear that. That's, that's wonderful. And, and you were recognizing how much love and he was given to you. So it sounds like you're ready to hear that. What a wonderful experience. And the other thing on that other end, so then the giving part. I think that a something that can become problematic, and it was for me, is um, we, Dr. Jennifer, she talks about this, and she got this idea from David Schnarch, and it's where we want to belong to ourselves, like the desire to belong to ourselves is even stronger than the desire to receive sexual pleasure. And so if we as women or anybody, if you don't step into your sexuality and really embrace it and own it and want to share it with another person, then you're constantly going to be feeling like your partner is taking it from you because you're not freely giving it. And so you're going to, over time, I became very resentful because I felt like my husband was constantly taking from me. And when I really stepped into my sexuality and had the strong desire to share it with my husband, 
it made all the difference in the world for me. I never feel like he's taking from me anymore because I've owned it. I've owned that sexuality. It is mine and it's mine to share. So those feelings completely went away. And so the resentful feelings went away. All that went away because my sexuality now belongs to me. If you don't mind, I want to emphasize that point. That is so, so critical in the process. And I love how you described it. When you're rejecting your spouse, you're setting him up for failure. And he, you're going to always feel like he's taking something away from you or burdening you. And I see that dynamic over and over and over again where the spouse, uh, the wife in this case, will set certain expectations until those expectations are met. Um, you know, there's no intimate physical intimacy, uh, whatever those expectations may be. And it sets the partner up for failure because you can't ever really live up to those expectations, whatever they be, you may be able to do it, but then it becomes a checklist and it's anything but intimate. And that creates that cycle downward, that spiral downward, because so well said because that's it feels like now you have it becomes this exchange of of mm -hmm. tasks and a burden yep. it does not create the intimacy so that is so hard to break but then what's reinforcing it is we're thinking well we're having this negative experience in our sexual dynamic uh relationship because because he isn't doing his part um mm -hmm. it becomes very deflective and so being able to look at this and say open up to it and then it's connecting it's beautiful mm -hmm. and then you have these experiences mm -hmm. now not everybody's going to have this there's in fact i'm very curious i would love to know at least your perspective what your husband was going through he's been he was giving and giving and giving for 27 years that's endurance and i, I would mm -hmm. have to say i know very few men who are able to maintain that level of of giving for so long without becoming mm -hmm. resentful and lost in their own sexuality. What do you think, if your husband wouldn't mind you sharing, what he was able to do to embrace that and, and continue patiently giving? And I'm not assuming he never had an issue of, you know, maybe resentment or hurt feelings. We're, we're human beings, right? But mm -hmm. What do you think allowed him to continue to be loving and patient over almost three decades? It makes me a little weepy. <laughs> um, he just had a very, very strong love for me. So it sounds like cheesy in a way to be like, it's because he loved me. Like, that's why he was able to endure it all. But that really was it. Like, he was so in love with me. And, and that's not to say that there weren't hard times. Like, there were times when things were rough and he would weep. And he would say, you know, you hurt me deeply. Like, you, you're not nice. And you hurt me deeply. But like, it was because he loved me so immensely that he endured it. And then also, when he prayed to know whether he should marry me or not, the answer that he got was yes, and take care of her. And he understood how broken I was from the trauma that I received as a child and a teenager, like he understood that he knew how broken I was. And, and I think also he knew I was trying like there, I did want to want it. And I express that often. Like, it's not that I was the type of person that I was like, I hate it. Don't talk to me about it. I don't want anything to do with it. I wasn't that type of a person. I was the type of person that I was longing to want it. I just didn't know how to get there. And so he was like very patient with me all those years of, and he just loved me through it and felt like he made that promise to Heavenly Father that he would take care of me. What would you say to men who, uh, I think there's a lot of men who have the level of love that your husband had, has for you but the years have taken such a toll on them in their relationship and they're experiencing this, their wife not wanting, you know, you can't even bring up sex anymore. You can't talk about it. It's become very isolating even to suggest therapy or some sort of intervention around sex is just yet another manipulation or selfish desire to have more sex. What are your thoughts around encouraging those husbands to support their wives who are disconnected from this, who aren't having that level of insight and they're starting to experience that bitterness? Any, 
any thoughts. They're not losing the love, but they're 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 lost themselves. It's been a, such a lonely experience that they don't know what to do. Do you recommend how husbands can support their wives and helping them understand their sexuality better? That's a situation that really breaks my heart. And I wish I could sit down with those wives and have a conversation with them because I feel like in a marriage where the wives have completely shut down, it is a very difficult place to be for men. And my heart really aches for them. I know that I've listened to a couple of podcasts by Jennifer Finlayson Fife where she addresses that. And she talks about how a husband needs to sit down with his wife and say, this is not okay for me. I need to feel loved in this way. And we have created this dynamic within our marriage to where we won't even talk about it. And that's just not okay for me anymore. Like I'm suffering and our marriage is suffering and I believe you're suffering as well. And something needs to change. I'm not an expert to speak on that, but I feel like from things I've heard from Jennifer, like she is an expert and has helped in that area. but. She talks a lot about how we each collude in the kind of marriage that we have. And I think that oftentimes in a marriage, if we're not speaking up in a loving way, but if we're not and and in a just kind of claiming what our desires are and what our needs are, if we're not speaking up about those, then we are colluding in the type of marriage that we're creating. I like that idea in what you're saying there, first of all. I think what you're saying is very helpful. I think a lot of women appreciate hearing that, that you feel sad that they're in those difficult, difficult places where they don't even, to even think about sex would just drain them and frustrate them and somehow getting out of that. But what I also liked is how to have that discussion. I think there's so much shame for men. You know, there's this, it's, um, I don't know if it's completely acceptable, but it tends to be more acceptable to not want to have sex. And so when the higher desire partner wants to have better sex or more connecting sex, it's viewed as selfish, uh, carnal. And so the the man in the relationship is experiencing these feelings of guilt, embarrassment. Yes, I want to have more sex. I want to have this type of sex. And so they're shutting themselves down before they even have that conversation with, with their wife. But I like how you said that when when you can frame it, put all other frustrations aside. A lot of times this conversation happens in connection to so many things, kids, busy life, stresses. And then we throw in, well, we're not even having sex anymore or or that's all you want. But to be able to have that dedicated conversation and say, sweetheart, I love you. And I want this area of our life to be better and to keep it um within that context, I think can set each other up for success and to be able to address those issues better. I really like that insight there. And the reason why I wish I could talk, like sit down and talk to the wives is I think we as wives really don't understand how that oftentimes, not in every marriage, but statistically or, you know, more regularly, it's, it's that a husband, the way he gives love and receives love is through physical intimacy like he feels it on a very deep level and we as wives do not understand that I think society has conditioned us to believe that men are just sex pots and that's all they want is sex they just want to use women's bodies to get their own physical pleasure and I don't think that's true at all I mean it can be true for some people that that, you know that they're selfish and they use their sexuality in, in selfish ways but I really believe for the most part that Men, that's how they are wired is to love deeply and give love deeply, to feel love deeply and give love deeply through their sexuality. And when I grew to really understand that, that's what changed for me a big thing in the bedroom. Like that night when I felt the goodness coming from him, it's because I wasn't just being like, yes, my husband's having sex with me. I felt on a deep level what he was offering to me from every fiber of his being. When you can receive that as a woman, it is amazing and beautiful. And so I wish women could understand that and calm down their anxiety surrounding their husband's sexuality and stop putting a label on what it is that they're wanting from and open up their heart to the fact that your husband just wants to really love you deeply. That helps for me a lot. 
I love this so much because one, one of my uh, mentors um, in, in this field has often said, who is your sexual role model? And I think that's one of the biggest obstacles that we face, both men and women in, in relationships, is you're doing something tremendous for women right now. You're providing, whether you like it or not, you're providing a healthy role model in the journey you took to get there. It, it's one thing to hear. You can have an amazing sex life. But what does that really mean when all your definition right now is around sex, your sexual relationship is shame, pain, and bearable at at times? What does it to even mean when we say a thriving, healthy sex life? I think a lot of people think, oh, just more sex. They don't understand what you're actually saying here is a beautiful, profound connection, which is exactly what they're desiring. And is being hindered because they can't see that. But the same thing for men. And unfortunately, I think a lot of men get into this place that thinking, just like women, uh, sex is bad, but yet they have these urges and desires and they don't know how to to manage them. And, and then they start to view themselves in the way that they've been told to view themselves. It's bad. It's dirty. They take on that definition. So they don't even engage in the conversation And I'll tell you from personal experience, because we don't have sexual role models and we don't understand what healthy sex looks like, which is a variety of experiences based on couples, personalities, cultures, and their relationship with the Lord, I didn't know what I wanted. And so it it was a frustrating conversation to have because even though my wife was willing to listen and not just willing, but embracing it, I didn't know what to say because I didn't know what I, I think I knew what I wanted in a relationship, uh, in a sexual relationship. But then I had to come to the understanding and be able to explain, you know what, this is what I'm curious about. I'm wondering if this will work well for me and for you. Let's reevaluate because I think we, we get, we finally have this big conversation, this, this vulnerable conversation where you're now in a place to have that conversation. Uh, and your husband is, what do I say? I just want better sex. And this is how I think we're going to get there. And then we hold to that. It's like, you don't want that. Well, you know what? I just discovered what I wanted in the relationship was to be able to explore that with you. It really had little to do with the actual physical act, but now I feel safe. I could tell you, I'm really curious about this. And I'm wondering if this will help in our relationship and not be shut down or viewed as selfish or promiscuous or dirty. I know in my personal experience that allowed me to at least redefine what a sexual relationship looked like because I really didn't know. I, I had no idea. And where do you begin with that? Even when your your wife is willing to have that discussion, uh, I think it's a, a daunting and scary experience. Um, but allowing yourself to reevaluate, come back and discuss. And I think that's been the most bonding opportunities with my wife is just being able to feel like we can openly discuss it. What's your experience around that? Or does that resonate with you? Yeah. Um, when when I was starting to, like, work through all these, all the things that, like, the breaks that I had on, like, the good girl syndrome and the, you know, marrying of the spiritual and sexual and just all that. When I was, like, really starting to work through those and, and be able to kind of push each one aside as I'd work through them, we started practicing. Like we had sex every day, every single day for probably about six weeks. And it really was a learning and a growing and a discovery time for the two of us. Just like, what, what does this look like? What does this sexual relationship between the two of us, what's it going to look like? And so we practiced and tried things and for six weeks, every single day. And it was a great learning experience for both of us where we both, felt free to express our desires and discover each other in a sexual way. What made you think of that? Uh, I mean, was that just something that you randomly thought of says, Hey, let's, let's do this every day for six weeks and see what happens. Or where did you get that idea from? We just started practicing and it just happened. <laughs> it just happened. I was like, okay. Hey. And, and it's, it's funny. And I have to say this. So, um, just recently in general conference, <laughs> the one man gave the talk about reading the scriptures or something. And he's like, every day, every day, every day. And wait, my husband and I laughed because when we were practicing, like, like when we would start again, my husband would like joke and he'd be like, every day, every day, every day. And so 
that just made us laugh so much when it came up on general conference. We looked at each other because it's just kind of something cute that he would say to me as we were practicing. But we never like said, here's the time frame. We're going to do this for six weeks. It just happened that I think we were just both excited that we were working on it, that we were discovering each other. It was exciting for us. You took away uh, in that strategy, if, if we call it that, this pur- uh, pursuer and avoider dynamic where he's pursuing and you're avoiding and you created it as a both come together. You're treating each other as equals. I think that's crucial. I think there's this, uh, as we engage into this discovery mode, um, we, we pay a little bit more attention like you, you've been cautioning people to do to put aside your fears, but there's still that fear there that they want to respect and they don't jump in like that. And I think that's really important. I think we're, we're preparing a little too much emotionally to go into sex and instead view it as let's learn. Let's try this. Let's schedule it. Let's um, at least plan for it in some way and make it a mutual goal. And that eliminates a lack of predictability uh, right now, as you, you know, at least at that point in your relationship, what I'm hearing is there is so much unpredictability and there's so much hurt or, and discovery that need to happen that you didn't want to give heed to that ambiguity anymore. You said, let's do this every day. Let's create some predictability. Let's be a team on this and come together. I, am I hearing you right? Mm-hmm. And one thing I want to say too about that, you know, pursuer and I, a couple years before that, one thing that we did that helped us transition then, because I, like I said, I, I did want to want sex. I did try different things throughout our marriage to figure things out. But one thing that was helpful for me is Laura Brotherson does talk about how sometimes husbands and wives can create anxiety within each other. And by the husband wife, she calls it like the hungry dog syndrome, where the husband, like, it's been a while since he's had sex and and he wants it and he's, you know, requesting it and his wife doesn't want it. And so he creates, we you know, we're creating kind of this hungry dog, like she calls it syndrome, where like he's chasing after her and like looking for any cues that she's throwing him that he, that he might get lucky that night. And, oh, yeah. And he, he kind of gets irritable and cranky because he's not getting his needs met and he's not being able to be close to his wife in the way that he wants. And so he gets cranky. And but the more he pursues her and chases after her, the more anxiety is created in her. And so she kind of is the avoiding wife. She will avoid touch. She will avoid flirting. She'll avoid any, you know, flirty looks from him because she doesn't want to send him a message in any way, shape or form that he might get lucky. And so you're creating this anxiety within each other outside of the bedroom where he's chasing and she's running all the time. And so I came to my husband one day and I just came up with this on my own. I sat down with him and I said, okay, I need to learn to not run from you. Anytime you go to hug me or touch me, like I, like if I'm at the kitchen sink and he comes up and fondles me, I would elbow him. Like, stop. You always have to be touching me. Like, I can't even begin to tell you how many times I said, can you not just love me for my brain? Does it always have to be about my body? I've said that so many times to him. Why does it always have to be about my body? And sad thing is he just wanted to be affectionate with me. He just wanted to love me. He just wanted to come and connect with me. But I always perceived it as this is sexual stop. So anyway, I sat down with him and I said, I need to learn to stop running. And so at that time, what I said was, can we please schedule sex? How many days a week would you like to have sex? And so we negotiated how many days that would be. And we said, okay, then I said, which days are those? And so we decided upon which two days of the week those were going to be. And I said, okay, I promise you that on those two days, I will say, yes, we will have sex. But on the other days, outside of the bedroom or even inside of the bedroom, no matter how much touch we give each other, you cannot ask me for sex. But I need to learn to become comfortable kissing you, embracing you, you know, allowing you to touch me in those fondling ways. And I need to learn to be able to calm my anxieties down around those type of touches. And I said, even if we full on make out on the couch, you cannot ask me for sex if it's a non-sex day so that I can learn to be comfortable with touch, with your touch, with your, you know, wanting to be just intimate with me, just through touch that's not sexual in nature, you know. I I can't tell you how successful that strategy is. Uh, Too many people feel like, oh, that's going to kill the mood and the desire by scheduling it. And I will even 
depending on the relationship, tell them to schedule specifically when you're going to do it. Nine o'clock at night, eight o'clock in the morning. Otherwise, we find we, we push it, push it out. But not everybody has to do that. I like your approach generally saying, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, for example, are sex days and it will happen that day. That allows us to put aside our anxieties. OK, I'm not going to engage because we're, as you said, the sexual dynamic becomes a pursuer and avoider experience where the man is looking for every clue, looking for all those micro expressions. Is this a flirt or is she just being nice with me? Can I go in for for a loving touch? Um, and then it feels like groping. It feels like inappropriate. It feels like objecting. And then it shuts down the loving engagement that the, the husband is trying to, to express. But by setting up a specific time, we're able to put those anxieties aside. Okay, I don't have to worry about being grabbed today randomly. Or I don't have to worry about um, constantly looking at my wife. Is, is this the right time? Is she giving me a clue? We put all that stress aside. So we've been able to eliminate that stress. We've already got too much stress in our our relationship and then to be able to engage and follow through with that. And a lot of couples feel like that kills a romance. And the first question I ask is, are you having romance right now? (laughs) No, no, none. And so uh, being able to create that predictability will then allow for romance to happen and you can create so excellent approach. Absolutely excellent. Because I found that, in doing that, being able to calm down that anxiety, then when he did come up, like, for instance, behind me at the kitchen sink and give me a hug and then maybe even, like, fondle me a little bit, I was able to learn to fold into that touch to really embrace that and appreciate it and just know that he just was wanting my attention. He was wanting to be affectionate with me. And I was able to fold into that instead of, like, you know, being angry, like, uh, he wants sex with me tonight. It's like, nope, it's not a sex night. I can fold into this. He's just wanting a moment with me at the kitchen sink. So that helped a lot. And that was a couple years before the whole exercise of every day. And now, like, it's not even a thought, like, we engage in all kinds of touch and, and flirting and it's not even a worry in either one of our minds if it will or will not lead to the bedroom. I mean, it's our relationship now. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Like all of it is just embraced and cherished. Do you, do you have any words, advice or cautions that you've learned from your relationship that you feel is important to share that we haven't addressed yet? Any cautions? Yeah, maybe maybe reflecting on your own approach. Um, what what words of advice would you give wives who are maybe willing to? Okay, this is scary for me. I want to open up and embrace my husband's sexual touches. Is there any words of caution around that? Do you feel like um, that can go wrong, or did it go wrong for you at any point, or any other aspects of of your sexual relationship and, and self discovery? I definitely feel like I still there are still boundaries. You know, and there are, I still give my permission, myself permission to, if there's a certain thing I don't like, I voice it just because we're, you know, being more open and accepting, you still have your boundaries and it is absolutely okay to voice your boundaries and say, I, I don't care for that. Or I don't like when you touch me in that certain way, it really bothers me because of this. I, I think is that that's, what you mean? Yeah, by- that's a great clarification because I, I don't want the listeners to think, okay, I want to follow Leanne's example and just give myself completely over to my husband's sexual desires and anything goes, you still get that right to say, I'm uncomfortable with this. I, I'm not sure about this. I'm not ready for that, whatever that boundary looks like. And so how do you go about, or how would you recommend going about that? Because it could be a fine line at times, right? You, you, you're wanting to explore but you also don't want to shut your partner down. How do you have that communication or navigate that, that disinterest or, or that boundary without shutting down or, or regressing in your, in your recovery? Well, for me, we have progressed so far that I do it kind of in a, just because of the personality that I am, I kind of do it in a, blunt but jokey way I will say to him like I am not a milk cow please don't touch me that way it makes me feel like a milk cow like stuff like that because we've come so far that it's not we know where we are it's not rejection no it's not rejection at all because he knows that nine times out of ten the way he touches me I love and I accept and I revel in and 
But if there's a certain way, I'll be like, hey, I, that doesn't feel good to me. And sometimes I'll make a joke out of it. But sometimes I'm like, but I would say, though, in the bedroom, like this is like outside of the bedroom, but in the bedroom, when you're trying new things, I definitely am more tender to be like, or more thoughtful of his feelings, like make suggestions, like, can we try this way? Because that way is hurting me a little bit. Or, you know, I'm more careful with how I so just because I just feel like that is so vulnerable place to be in the, you know, you're, <laughs> you're all there, your whole body, your, all of you is there. And so it is, I feel like more of a sacred space. And, and I think so I'm definitely more careful. Husbands need to embrace the idea once you get to at least this level of, of sexual development and, and healthy uh, approach, uh, recognizing it's not a rebuke. It's not a criticism. It's, I want you to pleasure me. And if you're willing, um, I could give you ideas on what will help. And right now that's not helping and being able to embrace that as a, as a learning tool and as a connecting tool, as opposed to feeling criticized and shut down. Uh, Cause I think husbands too often will hear, stop doing that and they stop everything <laughs> or they um, give up or whatever. I think husbands, I, they get such a bad rap. It just makes me so sad. But I think they are very sensitive in this area. Like they, they seem, they feel like they're, 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 like society tells them that they should be these, you know, sexual experts who, you know, should automatically know what, how to please a woman or whatever. And it opens them up to, I mean, there's a lot of pressure that they feel to try to please their wives. And then I want to talk about that for a minute. So the learning, learning each other sexually like too often we just we we think that men just need to automatically know what their wives would want and recently i've heard this idea and concept and it's absolutely true and made so much sense in my head you're the only one that's in charge of your sexual pleasure like you're in charge of it because you're the only one that's in your head and inside your body your husband's not he doesn't know what you're thinking he doesn't know what you're feeling inside of your body and so yes he's trying to pleasure you but if you don't voice if that's pleasurable or not he's not gonna know and so it takes a lot of communication and if a wife is not receiving if she's unhappy with her sex life and basically all they're having is intercourse because she hasn't voiced anything different and she hates it and resents it well my question to them is, have you asked for anything different? Because how is he supposed to know what that you want anything different? And I think men, that, and I talked about this in my last, last podcast, but men and women really do, do need to understand each other's sexualities and how we tick and that women are tend to be more emotional. And if my emotional needs were not being met outside the bedroom, then it is hard for me to then be physical with my husband. If I feel like he was being is but was mean to me on a certain day or just really being grumpy and kind of taking it out on me, I'm going to be less inclined to want to then be physical with him in the bedroom if he asks me for it. It's like, um, but you were kind of a jerk today. Like, I'm not feeling emotionally connected to you because you hurt my feelings. Um, but sometimes maybe we need to get to the bottom of that. Like, have you had a rough day? You seem really stressed today. Can I help you with that at all? Can we talk about that? And, you know, maybe at the end of the day and the end of that conversation, yes, he was really stressed. And yes, he was, would love to be with us intimately to get some tenderness from us to relieve that stress. And so, yes, we can't like completely shut them down because they were barky to us outside the bedroom. But I think men also do need to understand that it's important for women to feel connected on an emotional level with their husbands in order to be able to be intimate in the bedroom. But then on the other hand, women need to understand that men, that's the way they connect with you is through the physical. They That's the way they show you that they love you and you need to love and embrace that. And women and men, like we've talked about before, we need to figure out what each other likes. We need to like have some sensate focus exercises within our marriage where you're just, just really discovering each other's bodies and discovering what each other likes. And like that needs to be happening 
women need to figure out what they love, so do men, and, and we need to come together as a couple and, and figure out what then together we can do to bring the most pleasure to each other in all aspects, in the four levels, spiritual, you know, mental, emotional, like bring all that together, figure it out. And it, it's a journey. Like I think things, people think it's going to happen overnight. It is not going to, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey and you need to embrace it as a journey. Like this is a journey of discovery that we are on together and embrace it and be excited about it. And it never ends because we're constantly changing no. as human beings, biologically, emotionally, stress, whatever. And so if we think, oh, uh, you know, that's a mistake. We finally feel like we've had some breakthroughs. We, we enjoy sex this way. And I think that's why a lot of couples get stuck in a rut and repeating certain you know, routine sexual behaviors is because we knew it worked then, but it still needs to be discovered. Is this still working and explore that? And, and also a thought going back to, to what you're saying about, you know, if he's grumpy, I, I actually recommend that you first have sex. And I, and I think it goes along with this concept of being responsible for your own sexual arousal, not making somebody else a partner or excuse me, uh, uh, relying on somebody else for your arousal. There is definitely, there is definitely a need for your partner to be loving and kind to you to help that along. But I've often uh, suggested have sex and then have that conversation of you, you appeared grumpy today and it was kind of hard to be around that. Can we talk about that? And you'll find in almost every situation after you have sex, it's much easier to have that conversation much, much easier and to recover and, uh, and, and reduce that type of behavior. Sex really is a, or can be, um, kind of a balm, like a healing balm for couples. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It, it really is. It's such a beautiful gift that God has given to couples and it breaks my heart to see all the struggle that surrounds it um, because when the barriers can be broken down and husbands and wives can really work on this part of our relationship, their relationship, it really is a healing bomb for the rest of their relationship. Like it's like the, the crowning jewel and, and it just, it breaks my heart when, so many couples just struggle with it and so many women just shut it down, like not understanding it at all, not understanding what it can be. It just, it really makes me sad. I, I think we focus a lot on, you know, how the adversary can corrupt the sexual experience. And we generally view that in the context of um, perverting it and, and physical acts. But the one aspect that the adversary tries to destroy sexuality is by avoiding it. If, if he can't corrupt it, then avoid it. I, I refer to that as sexual silence and that can take in on many, many forms, whether it's just not talking about it or avoiding it or saying a certain behavior is bad. Um, it shuts it down and it creates that divisiveness. But if we're, we're able to use sex in a way to communicate, we could bring each other together. And I, that's, that's the beauty that I hear you saying over and over today. I, I fully believe that. Like my husband and I have talked about those, that's so this very thing quite often the the adversary, like before we're married, he will tempt us with trying to get us to have sex outside of marriage. But then after we're married, <laughs> stop, <laughs> he will try to get us to stop having sex. It is so true. Because he knows that will wreak havoc within a marriage. And he doesn't care how he destroys a person. He doesn't care if he's having you have sex outside of marriage or getting you to stop having sex inside of marriage. He'll try to get to destroy people in any way he can. And he, he knows how powerful a marriage is when they can be deeply connected sexually. A, a marriage that is truly intimate in all levels of their marriage, that is a powerful marriage. And Satan knows that. And he will try to get at it in any way he can. And the biggest way he does it is by shutting down sexuality. Absolutely. I firmly believe that. Absolutely. Leanne, you, you've been so insightful. Is there any other 
things that you would like to address before we we end today's podcast? Okay, one more thing really, really Absolutely. fast. Absolutely. Take your time. Can I just say can I just say that having kids is really tiring? And I my husband and I weren't able to have children, but we adopted two children. And um sex and being able to work on your life, sex life gets easier and easier as the kids get older and older. And so I would just say give give yourself grace in this area like no both husbands and wives need to realize that kids can be exhausting and there's seasons of our lives that are harder for us to work on our and our sex lives just because of exhaustion there are two things that kill desire the most one is is exhaustion and the other one is being pressured if you feel pressured to have sex or if you are exhausted, those are the two main killers of desire. And um, and so I just want to say just know that and work through that. It's, it's going to be tricky to work through when your kids are small, especially. But just try to keep to keep working on that as much as you can because and just keep looking forward to that day that like it's going to get easier it's going to get easier and now that we're empty nesters like it's amazing because we work on it whenever we want but um but but we had something to work on it on the other side of our kids being gone like we started working on this a couple years ago and so we weren't staring at each other when both of our kids are gone saying we don't we don't know who we are anymore. Like, who are you? I haven't, I haven't been creating this relationship with you all these years. I don't even know you, but just, and husbands, um, I didn't realize how hard kids were until I had my little grandbaby for two weeks, a couple weeks ago. And he kicked my butt. I had him for two weeks and I was exhausted. And it really made me appreciate again, young mothers and, so husbands, like just step in where you can to help her, especially if it's a night that you know you're going to have sex, like help her get the kids to bed, help her with dinner, help her relieve some of that exhaustion so she has some energy left for you at the end. Because honestly, kids are, kids are, kids can be exhausting. Yes, they can. I discovered that. Absolutely. <laughs> Discover that a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, oh my gosh. And with those, to borrow this idea that we talked about earlier, even uh, in my opinion, I, I find that w- with kids, scheduling is even more important because you can do it during nap time and create some sort of expectation around that positive expectation uh, with your spouse so that you don't feel like you're being demanded from constantly. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Leanne. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing um, more of your, your story. Thank you. Can I say one more thing really, really of fast? Course. Go for it. <laughs> okay. One thing that helped me the most, and then I'll be done. It's been bugging me because I knew I wanted to say it, and I couldn't remember what it was. Um, because men and women's desire is so different, we there's um, like responsive desire versus what's the other one? I'm sure you know it. Um, responsive. Um, dang. Uh, oh, versus spontaneous. So a husband is more spontaneous desire, like. When he thinks about sex, he's ready to go right then. And a woman is more responsive. She kind of has to kind of start being intimate and then the desire comes. And so the biggest thing that helped for me was to always have a pilot light lit with inside of me. And what the pilot light says to me is that I am so connected to you and I want to be known by you and I want you to know me. And I want to connect on a deep level. We are already connected on that deep level. And so that pilot light is always lit. And whenever um, whenever my husband wants to be intimate or whatever, and I initiate just as much as he does now, but whenever he does want to, to initiate, my, the answer is always yes, because that pilot light is like, yep, and I know it'll take me a little bit to get in the mood. Like right now, I'm not sex- sexually feeling it in this moment, like I'm not turned on in this moment, but I know that once we get started, it will come. And I think so often women are like, I just don't have a sex drive. I just don't think about it. I don't have a sex drive. Well, it's because we're created differently. We're not, we're responsive. We have to be talked into sex or feel, you know, start to um, engage and then the response comes. And so I think we, we as women need to remember that, like, 
you might not feel like you're in the mood right now, but start start being intimate and you'll find that not too long into it, you're in the mood. And so keeping that pilot light always lit for me is very helpful. I think that was a wonderful way to end this. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yep. Time. Yep. Thank you. All right.